And we are live and never has it felt so good to say those words. <laughs> Welcome, mystery and thriller mavens. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so delighted to host the incredible Lisa Unger for the fourth time tonight <gasps> here to give us the inside scoop on her brand new red hot book out tomorrow, Last Girl ghosted lisa unger welcome to mystery and thriller mavens tell us about this book hi sarah thanks for having me on oh i God, love hanging out. i love hanging out with you i love hanging out with you i love hanging out with you yay yeah so i'll tell you a little bit about um last girl ghosted so i had this conversation that you know there's always like one seed right like one germ and it was a, in this case, it was a conversation that I had with a young friend of mine and she was talking Ooh. about her experience with dating apps. Yeah. Yeah. And she was saying like how there was this endless pool of choices, you know, Ooh. and it was just like swipe to the next, swipe to the next, swipe to the next. And she said, how could you ever know if you chose the right person? And then she went on to talk about how, like, well, when this person, you know, you have these, like, kind of online encounters, right? You see these, like, curated posts that they, they have of themselves, these pictures that they put out there. And then you meet that person in real life. And if it doesn't really match up, that, you know, there's no connection really to this person. So if you're not interested, it's just super easy to go to ghost them. You know, to just, and they disappear from your life because you didn't really have those close tie connections. You know, once upon a time, the dating pool was really tiny and it was like your town, your church, your workplace. Later, it's like your city, clubs and bars, stuff like that. But like, you know, or you meet through friends. And so there are these external ties, but now there really isn't. So there's no external reason to treat each other well. And this conversation just stayed with me. It just made it feel, I mean, it seemed, it was very sad. I found it sad. Like it was like, wow, this like modern search for love, like it's, it's broken, you know, it's broken. So it kind of, that kind of idea stayed with me. And then usually what happens is I hear a voice or character voices. And in this case, it was Ren. And I didn't know too much about her, but I knew that she was, you know, that she came from, you know, sort of darkness. She came from trauma, of course, right? <laughs> right? I mean, it is a Lisa Unger book. And, um, you know, she's, but she's built a life, you know, she's built a life that she's kind of happy in, but she's, you know, her best friend kind of pushes her into the online world of online dating. Her best friend, Jax, is like, you don't have any fun. You work all the time. You know, are you, do you want to be alone? Do you want to be alone forever? And she's kind of like, so she gets pushed into it and she has some like underwhelming encounters and then she meets Adam and she thinks that he's the one and they have a white hot romance. And, um, then after a particularly romantic evening, he he makes a request. He says, tell me something that you've never told anyone. And she does, because that's what you do in a relationship, right? You reveal yourself in layers. And, um, and the next day, he ghosts her. He disappears. His profiles are gone. His phone's been disconnected. The place where he was living is just a vacation rental. And she's devastated. You know, she's given herself to this person. She thought, you know, she fell hard, even though she didn't want to. And then when a uh, private detective shows up, she comes to understand that there are other women that he met, other women who thought that they were in love, that he was the one. And all those other women have disappeared. And so Ren decides to follow his very dark digital trail into his past, his dangerous past, and into her own. Mm. Ooh, Lisa Unger. That's right there. <laughs> well, you hooked us good. Oh, all my right. goodness. You hooked me from the first page of this book, and I know you hooked all of our uh, friends who are joining us on Facebook, on YouTube, wherever wow. you're watching, Murder by the Books channels, my channels, Mystery and Thriller Mavens, private Facebook group, wherever you're watching from. 
um, because that is one tasty, a tasty introduction. And I have so many questions. I can't wait to get into it. But first, I just want to welcome everybody. If you've been here before, you know how this works. And if you're new, welcome. Here's how it works. Every Monday for hashtag Mystery Monday, because you know Mondays can be murder, I give you two featured authors, and you get to ask them anything. So ask the renowned, the legendary New York Times internationally bestselling Lisa Unger, translated into over 30 languages, sold millions of copies worldwide. Ask her about last girl ghosted. Ask her about her writing process. Ask her about the darkness. We got a lot of questions, (laughs) lots of questions. Let's get right to them. Oops. Tori Eldridge, welcome. She said she is psyched to hear all about Last Girl Ghosted, you and me both. Tori, thank you so much for joining us. Um, And Tori also says, she said, this is hilarious and so true. And I believe that she's responding to Lisa, your comment that said, of course, Ren came from darkness. This is a Lisa Unger book. (laughs) Uh, yeah. Which is hilarious, as Tori said, <laughs> and so, so true. So we, um, I in my Mystery and Thriller Maven Facebook group, I let people submit questions in advance. So let's mm-hmm. kick off with those. This one coming in from Nancy Merrow, and she would like to know, how did you come up with the name Wren? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I, I A lot of times my characters just come with their name. And this is kind of a, this is kind of a weird thing. And it kind of, you know, touches a little bit on my, on my process. So my process is really subconscious. You know, I don't have a lot, I don't have a lot of access to it, which is kind of a a weird thing to say. And, um, you know, so usually when I start hearing a voice, I really just have that voice in my head. I don't know that much about it. Like when Ren, when I first started hearing Ren's voice, I only knew that she came from trauma. I knew that, you know, she had experienced some kind of darkness, but that she um, is using that experience to lead other people into the light, to lead people through their um, their own traumas, you know, through her work as um, an advice columnist called uh, Dear Birdie. And so I knew that, um, and, and a, the bird, sort of the bird theme has run through a lot of my books. I've been obsessed with birds for a really long time. And I'm just like kind of a bird information junkie. So I'm always like taking in as much information as I can. And um, I... Um, I guess that maybe that's where it came from. You know, there's a, uh, she has a, uh, without giving too much away, she has a childhood friend uh, named Robin. And um, that figures into the story pretty prominently. So it was just kind of, you know, and then uh, I've had a lot of, um, a lot of crows show up in my work over the last few years, the House of Crows and also the Sleep Tight Motel um, had a strong crow theme. So, um, I, you know, I feel like that's just kind of a thread that that's run through, um, the work, like, you know, even, um, my book, uh, the stranger inside, I had wanted to call it the night jar, which is a, a hawk that hunts at night. And my editor was like, no, (laughs) (laughs) she's like, no, nobody knows what that means. I'm like, I know that's like intriguing, right? Like you would want to find out. She's like, no, (laughs) like, okay. (laughs) Wait, did you say the night jar? Like a jar? jar. Yeah. I didn't know that that was the name of a bird. The night Um, jar. Yeah, it's also called the night hawk. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, cool. Well, um, I am fascinated. So I, I love birds. Mm -hmm. So I love birds so much. And um, I think my, so my, my two favorite birds are one, a hummingbird. A mm, okay, yeah. hummingbird because I'm yeah. just so fascinated that they can hover there like a helicopter. Yeah. And I love they're the amazing. sound of their buzzing, their yeah. humming wings. Yeah. And they're so tiny and they're so cute. And their long beaks that, you know, reach into the flower to draw out the nectar. Oh my God. I love hummingbirds. And my yeah. other favorite it are owls. Oh. Any owl. Yes. 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 Mm. I'm with you on that. 
Those what are is, two of my favorite birds. What are what is your spirit animal bird, Lisa? What What's is your favorite? my spirit animal bird? I guess if I were going to pick one, I would pick the red-tailed hawk. Why would you pick the red-tailed hawk? Well, I so when we were, I was traveling uh, with my family. We were in Ireland, and we stayed at a place called Ashford Castle. And at this place, they had um, this a school, a school of falconry. And we decided that we were going to do what's called a hawk walk. And um, we went to the school and my daughter, Ocean, and I and my husband, Jeff, we went out with this falconer and he taught us how to fly a red-tailed hawk. And so we had a one-year-old red-tailed hawk called Inca and she flew with us in the forest and she would land on our arms and um, then she would chase after, you know, various things that he threw for her. She wasn't actually hunting, but there was just something about the bird. And I learned so much about falconry, which I did not understand that, you know, they, that it's a, it's a hunting sport that in fact, you know, these birds hunt with people and as a reward for, you know, sort of killing the animal that they're hunting, they get the or they get the the organ meat from the inside of the animal, and then the hunter gets the the flesh, you know, the meat to bring home to his whatever tribe, yes. town, whatever it is. Anyway, so the thing about it that I found so intriguing was um, that it was there was something so strangely familiar about walking through the woods with this bird following you. And come to understand that, you know, hawks are pack animals, that they're, you know, they, they want to be with their people. They want to be with other birds. And so um, I just found that experience very, very moving. And I think about that hawk all the time, how light she was, how beautiful, how just, you know, dangerous and, you know, how she was also like a killing machine, you know, just amazing and powerful. And so I think about that bird a lot. So I, I don't know that I would necessarily say that, you know, that was my, you know, uh, you know, under other circumstances, I might not say that that was my spirit animal, but since you asked, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. Well, hawks are fascinating because I, I mean, I saw a hawk in the Boston public garden, dive down, grab a rat. Yeah. And kill it and dismember it and devour it and yeah. it was the sh the violence of it and the yeah. the, the precision of it precision, was yeah. put it look away but it was also horrifying and violent but yeah. it also was like shocking and amazing um, yeah wow yeah. yeah hawks are amazing oh my god this is yeah. so cool anyway that was the whole that was the whole yeah that was an amazing experience i mean that was and we almost didn't do it because i was like I, ocean was little she was young i was like mm. i don't know is this safe and then we wound up just do it like we do so many things. She's like, well, whatever, we're here. Let's just let's just do it. And so she and she, I mean, the pictures that we have from that that experience and then her memory of it is just like, I mean, it was just so moving for all of us. It was like mm. such an amazing experience. I love that. I love that. And um, and 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 funnily enough, Nancy's last name is Ren, Nancy Murrow oh, Ren. So I think <laughs> that's in, that, in that question and leading us into this very uh, um, fascinating backstory about your interest in birds. We're seeing that manifest in, uh, in the name Ren and her best friend Robin from her childhood. A very interesting yes. relationship there, Lisa. Yes. Um, and also Birdie, dear Birdie, the name of her advice column. So exactly. we're seeing this manifest in lots of different ways. And what I yeah. thought, I mean, there's so much to get in here to here, but what was, I love that she was an advice columnist, but yet struggling with so much in her life, which is so yeah. true, right? Like we often, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think most people like, you know, they'll say like, you know, um, that most people become psychiatrists or psychologists because they're, you know, they've, they've wrestled with all of the, of their own stuff. And, you know, they want to, you know, to do that for others, to help other people find their way forward. And, you know, that's, a, that's a way that she, you know, metabolizes some of the things that happen to her. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Now let's talk about um, the white hot relationship that you, that you referenced. So one of the many things that I loved about this book is how Lisa, how powerfully you captured that thrill, that, that, that addicting thrill of a new love where you just, you meet someone and you feel this incredible connection. And I was like, oh my gosh, am I feeling a little, a little dizzy here? Like, woo, <laughs> woo. Um, because it, you capture it so well. And and I think it's also sort of a young love. Um, and I don't yeah. know, because I, ha- I haven't had that experience of meeting someone new in my forties. Um, but right. I remember you know, being her age and, and feeling that thing where you just, you had to know more about that person and and you feel so safe with that person. You think this is my person. This is him at last he's here. And you're just, you're just, Oh, you just want to devour them and immerse yourself in them. And, And you captured that intoxicating, addicting, thrilling, pulse pounding like you can't think about anything else feeling of new love so perfectly that i i mean i was experiencing it again it was amazing um and then of course and he says and it's so sexy you know tell me something you've never told anyone else and of course she's like here's me and but we don't know what it is we don't know what it is but she right tells, we know she reveals it um and yeah. then of course and then he disappears which is so painful and so garbaging of course yeah. it's this thing that she's so deeply ashamed of um, yes Yes. But I thought what well, what else was interesting is how many times have all of us thought, oh my gosh, that person is mad at me or that person doesn't like something that I did or whatever. And actually it has nothing to do with you. Right. <laughs> and so usually, I, usually. <laughs> usually. Usually it doesn't, right? I mean. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And then I love how obsessed she gets. And she's like, you know, because, and I know a lot of us true crime fans were like, we're going to keep digging on the clues. We're going to keep going here. And she's going right. to, she's going to get her answer. And I'm cheering for her. I'm like, get that answer, Rin, get that answer. And even when she, you know, she goes and it's only this hotel, yeah, an Airbnb or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then, but she tracks down that guy and he says, well, he didn't pay for it. So she writes a check for $5,000 and that's yeah. a huge, I mean, sobering yeah. amount. But then I yeah. think it's worth it, Rin, get the closure. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So when you were, um, I'm assuming that you did not meet your husband through the dating app culture. I didn't. I met, I mean, I met my husband the old fashioned way at a, at a bar. (laughs) I met my husband at Sloppy Joe's in Key West. (laughs) Yeah, we were both, we were both on vacation. I was on vacation from New York and Jeff is on vacation from Detroit. And we met on the dance floor at Sloppy Joe's and it was literally like, love at first sight, you know, immediately. And we had this like kind of whirlwind, like, you know, just super intense six month, you know, kind of just love affair. We were traveling back and forth every weekend. Um, and then he proposed and, you know, like really fast. And, um, we both sold our homes, quit our jobs and like moved to Florida. And that's when I sent my first book off to, um, to find an agent and try to try to get published. So that kind of all sort of came together at the same time. But before that, I had, you know, I'd been with somebody for a really long time. And then I was, you know, single and dating. And just at that, like, moment in time, like, internet dating had just sort of started. It, there was no, there were no apps. There was nothing like there is now, but there were dating sites, like, like websites. And so I did have a couple of like weird and like, uh, or just bad, underwhelming, not right encounters. And I kind of, I always remember the feeling of that, like almost like the soullessness of trying to connect with somebody that way. And, you know, like I sort of carry, kind of carry that piece with me, but I know that a lot of people have uh, met their husbands and wives online, you know, and been very successful. I mean, and here are some people sharing it with us. Yeah. Stephanie Cooper saying yeah, she, 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 she said I, did. I met Cooper almost nine years ago on Match.com. Yeah. Uh, 
Tori Eldridge saying, oh my gosh, how romantic meeting yeah. this sexy stranger, mysterious stranger on yeah. the dance floor at Sloppy Joe's. Stephanie saying, we put a deposit on our on building a new house five weeks after we met. Yeah. Exactly, Stephanie, that intoxicating. It was like that moment, like when you just know, right? In, in, the, in Stephanie's case, in my case, it was the right impulse. But, you know, Ren is so... She's so fragile. She has so many layers. She's been yes. so like cocooned mm. for so long, you know, like, and then like later in the book, you know, like, right, you know, Rob, Robin asks her and she's also like, in some ways talking about Ren's mother, she, you know, like, did you see that? Did you see the darkness in him? Is that why you loved him? And that may have been part of it as well, because sometimes mm. when you come from trauma and you come from ab abuse, mm -hmm. you think that, so you think that things are love and they're not, they're not. And so there's a little bit of that element to the story as well. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, George Beach is saying, I guess he had the moves like Jagger. <laughs> I guess he did. Uh, so he's saying, absolutely. Um, and Stephanie says she loves her friend Robin. Yes, I was very intrigued by her best friend, Robin. We all need yeah. a best friend like Robin, I think. Um, Lisa also, uh, Stephanie is sharing that she finished uh, Last Girl Ghosted late last night. Stephanie is a, a bookstagrammer extraordinaire. Oh, she is yeah. at Fire Pit and Books. Oh, nice. Um, and she said it is so freaking <gasps> yes. good. Thank you. Thank it you. was cash. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Licha is saying hello from Texas. Licha, Hi. welcome. Great to have you. Thanks for jo joining in. Uh, George is saying CJ Box in his books has a character who is a Faulkner slash Hawker. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Leecha is saying, I saw my husband first when he applied where I worked. I was hoping he would get the job because I liked him. He got the job. We got to talk to each other. We went out. Well, one month after we moved in together, a year later, we got married and we have been together for 44 years and married for 45. Oh my God, Leecha, I love that. That's See, beautiful. Heart knows. Yeah. She's saying it does. It your does. book sounds very sounds and looks very intriguing. Yes, it I is. Love it. I and I want to tell you that um, it is out tomorrow. It's mm -hmm. out tomorrow, you guys. And you can buy it tonight and it will ship out to you tomorrow. And guess what? Murder by the Book has signed copies. Yes. Awesome. So you can get signed copies. Um, and 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 you will get your signed copy of Lisa Unger's latest book. Yay. Yay. So I'm putting the link in the comments right now. So grab your copy. Stephanie's saying, oh my gosh, that's amazing. It is. It is. So you guys, we have, uh, I want to open the floor up to questions. So this is your time to chat with Lisa Unger um, and ask her anything you want. Stephanie's saying this was her first Lisa Unger book and I've already started buying her previous ones. Oh my gosh. So my I favorite thing is to dis is to discover a new author and then go down the rabbit hole on their backlist. So you know what, Stephanie, I'm going to put her backlist in the comments right here so you can grab every single one of her books because, oh my God, you have to read House of Crows. You have to read. It is, it's so freaking good. And then you have to read um, Confessions of the 745. So crazy. You're <laughs> You will not see that last twist coming, girl. And then you just have to go back through the backlist. You'll love it. Um, so there is the link right here. I'm plopping it in for everybody. So there you can just go through and grab her backlist because it's so good. And then you can grab today's. Lisa would like to know, um, Lisa, do your book characters talk to you? And if they do, do you have, um, if they do, have you ever had to change something in the story because of it? Oh, fascinating question. Lisa, give us a peek into your creative process. Yeah. So I do always hear the voices of my characters. And in fact, every single, every single element of the plot flows from the character voices in my head. Like there's no plot when I sit down to write, like I'll just have like I was saying, like just a germ, something that, you know, got me thinking about a certain subject matter, maybe got me researching about a lot of different things, things that are like obsessing me. And then the best way I can describe it is if it, if it like connects with something deeper that's going on with me, then I start to hear a voice or voices. Sometimes it's more than one voice. And I follow those voices through the manuscript. So when I first sit down to write, I have like some kind of like idea. I have like a vibe 
about what the book is. I can almost, it's almost like I can see the shape of it, but I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I mean, I don't know at all what's going to happen. Like, I don't know who's going to show up day to day. I don't know what they're going to do. I don't really know how, what the book is about. And I definitely don't know how it's going to end. And so I'm always let, allowing my characters to dictate the story. Like there's never a time when they don't, you know, like I follow their, you know, I follow their voice through the narrative and I've done this for, well, I just typed the end on my uh, 20th novel. So I've done this, um, you know, with, ev with every book, it's how every book has, has been written. And so it just, you know, that, that's how the story evolves for me. It evolves for me on the page, the same way that it will for my reader, you know, like I sort of write for the same reason that I read because I want to know what's going to happen to the people living in my head. So it's always a surprise. There's always something, there's always something big. I love that. I love that. I write for the same reason that I read because I want to know what happens. Now, that's why I read. That's why we all read. Am I right, fam? Yeah. Um, Licha is saying, thank you so much for answering my question. Oh, Licha, you're I so welcome. welcome. This is your chance to ask this incredible, incredibly brilliant, gifted woman anything you want. She's here to chat with us. So um, thank you for asking your question. And Lisa, thank you for that lovely answer. Now, when they're guiding you, uh, Stephanie's saying that is so cool. Absolutely. Now, when they're talking to you, though, do they ever guide you down a path where you're like, wait, guys, Ren, Robin, I'm stuck. Like, where do I go from here? And and it, and then they don't lead you to the next answer. You got to back, back, back it up out of that out of that dead end alley or it always just works out for you. That's how that's how well oiled of a machine you are. Well, you know, like it's a you know, it's an organic writing is an organic process, you know, and like all organic process, there's an ebb and there's a flow. So, you know, you have these days where the pages are just flowing you know, you couldn't stop it from coming, right? And the story is just unfolding and you're really seeing it clearly. And then, uh, you know, you you do run into these kind of narrative, you know, blocks, I guess, where you're just like, okay, you know, and you kind of sit around for a while and you're like, what are we doing? Where are we going? You know, and then after a certain point, like, you know, you have to get up, right? You just, you can't just sit there. So you've got to, You've got to exercise or you've got to go do the laundry like you can't do anything else you can't go on social media you can't answer email you can't do like anything like that that's not that's not going to help the problem but you can go do something like you know you can do yoga you can walk you can go for a run you can go to the gym you can bake a cake you know, you can do, you can do something like that, but that, and, and then that's where you kind of, where I always find the next foothold or the next, hear the next voice or see the next scene. So like a lot of times this happens on the treadmill, like that's where I'm like, oh, right, that's it. Or like, I will dream about it. And, um, you know, like at night and that's like, you know, there's a lot of 3am wake ups when you write the way I write, there's a lot of like, <gasps> okay. And then, and then you get up and you, you work. Right. So that's kind of the way, that's kind of the way it works for me, the way it's always worked for me. So. Very cool. Thank you so much for that um, wonderful insight into your creative process, Lisa. That's really, really cool. Okay, the questions are pouring in. Y'all, I'm going to get to them all. I promise you. Um, I'm just backing up back here just to make sure I don't miss anything because these are so, so good. Um, okay, I think I missed one. Just trying to scroll through and find it really quickly. Um, and then we'll get to the next one. Okay, you guys. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> I'm losing. It through. I'm gonna get to them. I promise. It's hard to do that, right? Like to look through the questions and talk and do all of the stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh! But I got it. Okay, Erin so would like Hi, to. Say, she wants to know: Will we ever hear from Lydia Strong or Ridley Scott again? Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. They are two um, of my absolute favorite characters. Um, tell us about that, Lisa. Yeah, so Lydia Strong is my first, she was the protagonist of my very first series, um, my very first novel, Angel Fire. So Lydia Strong is a true crime writer. 
And, you know, um, she, yeah, comes from trauma. <laughs> And she, you know, sort of is a, you know, she's a, a writer and she kind of, you know, sort chases monsters and I guess in a way to order chaos and occasionally like they turn around and chase her back. And so that was my, those for uh, my first four books were with, with Lydia Strong. And um, then uh, after that fourth book in the Lydia Strong series, I uh, published Beautiful Lies, which is Ridley, Ridley Jones. And Ridley Jones had, had two books. Um, and, you know, I, I do think about them. I do think about both of those characters from, from time to time. And they are two of the characters that I get the most mail about, you know, like, is there going to be another Lydia Strong? Is there going to be another Ridley Jones book and um i um i don't know i guess it'll you know it's really just a matter of whose voice is loudest you know um how you know who who, who is really conspiring to <laughs> get themselves into a new book and i don't always plan it like with last girl ghosted like i was not expecting jones cooper i didn't think he was going to be i I wasn't expecting him. I wasn't expecting the hollows, which is like my fictional town. So I wasn't expecting the hollows is one that is really conspiring always to get into every book. Like it wants every book to be about it, but it can't always be about the hollows. And so, but like this time it was like, okay, well, I guess we're here. So we might as well stay. And that's, you know, I didn't really, I don't feel like I really control that. Of course I did, but it doesn't feel like I did. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love that. Sharon is saying hi from Minnesota. Top community member there. Sharon, hi. welcome. Always such a delight to have you. Thank you so much. Um, George is saying good evening. Everything. <laughs> I cannot wait to sink my teeth into this. Erin saying she is so excited for the book. this book. I love Lisa Unger on book tour. Erin, I love Lisa Unger on book tour too. How do you love Lisa Unger? She is such a delight. She's so humble and down to earth and kind and brilliant. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Lisa, your oh, special pre-launch event with Murder by the Book and the Mystery of Thriller Mavens. Tori Eldridge saying she's also a bird junkie. Cool tidbit to the the Wren name backstory. Thank you again for Nancy Murrow Wren for submitting that question in advance. Very cool here. Um, uh, Aaron saying she also likes the name for the title, the title of the night chart. I do too. I think that's really yeah. cool. Um, Sharon wants to know, do flamingos count? <laughs> of I course think they, they do. do. They count. You're in Florida, Lisa. I'm in Florida. Florida. Of course right? flamingos count. Well, it's interesting too, that there's another really cool pink bird, um, called the roseate spoonbill. What? Oh yeah. my goodness. Okay. And we, so I live on the water. I live on the intercoastal. I actually live on a tiny, tiny little strip of land bet between the Gulf of Mexico and the intercoastal. So Ooh. in an active, you know, hubris, that's where we live. <laughs> uh, we, um, we have the mangroves across from our house. And a lot of times you can see the roseate spoonbills just kind of hanging out in the shallows. And they're like this very like cool pop of pink. Um, against the you know dark green of the mangroves, and so rosy spoonbills count, flamingos count, all birds oh count. They're all all, ba all birds count. Sharon saying yeah. birds are seriously birds are amazing. Birds they are. are amazing. They are. They really are. They are I mean, amazing. They're fascinating. Tori saying she loves red hailed red tailed hawks. She has one yeah. that purchased one really to watch in the morning. Tori, I think you should probably look up what is the meaning of a red tailed hawk. Let's yeah. look up that spirit animal. Melissa is saying hello from Australia. I have loved Lisa's books Hi. ever since I fell in love with <gasps> El oh, Eloise Montgomery. Oh. It's just so great to have a true fan here. And thank you for joining us all the way from Australia. Oh, so sorry. appreciated. George saying, just finished The Bright Edge of the World by Eowyn Ivy. The wife in the story was very much in love with hummingbirds. Owls are my favorite too. George, you and I, kindred spirits, my friend. Um, uh, so great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Um, and, okay, just scrolling through everything, making sure I'm not missing anybody's comments because I know this is your time and I want to make sure I get to, to you. Um, I want to remind everyone that this book is for sale. You can get it tonight. So I'm popping it up into the comments. Um, grab your copy right now. Um, Stephanie is saying that she loves the name uh, Jones Cooper. Mm. 
very yeah. cool. Um, and, and, and he has a lot of, he's had a lot of, um, he's had a lot of books. So he first showed up in, uh, in Fragile. Mm. And when he showed up, I didn't think that much of him. I thought he was just, you know, just the husband. Just the husband. And, just the husband. And he turned out to have like kind of a pivotal role in that book. And then I left him at the end of the book kind of in a bad place, you know, not in the best place. And then I Mm. couldn't stop, I couldn't stop thinking about him. I couldn't stop thinking like, well, now what, you know, what's going to, what's he going to do now after, you know, you know, you kind of, I took a lot away from him um yeah. in that book and so i was like okay and so then i knew that i would and i also that it's interesting at the end of that book um fragile is also where eloise montgomery first showed up and when she showed up at the end of um fragile i was like oh a psychic that's interesting you know <laughs> and i thought <laughs> Well, what if she's a fraud and then you know maybe well even if she is a fraud that's a, that's okay that's that's interesting as well and so um you know but then i was surprised that she had kind of a small role to play like i thought she was going to have a bigger piece of that book and she wound up not and uh, and so i couldn't stop thinking about her either and so that's when i went on to write darkness my old friend which was the which was the next book and um, had a lot more to explore about um, Jones and Eloise. Ooh, well, thank yeah. you for that insider peek. I'm here for the insider peeks, Lisa. That's what I yeah. love for. Yeah. Um, George wants to know, do you ever find yourself taking on the personalities of your characters into your real life? That's so me? No. a terrifying question. <laughs> that is really scary. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? But but do you Lisa, do you, if you no. spend all day in the mind of Ren, um, do you find yourself being a little a little Ren like? Are you dishing out advice to like dear Birdie or <laughs> I'm always dishing out advice. I'm always, I am definitely I am definitely the person that people call for advice. Like that's for sure. Um, so I, there is a little bit, I guess there is a little bit of, of that, but I don't think it works that way. I don't think that the characters come off the page to influence me. I mean, when you really think about, I mean, I have stopped thinking about characters like a long time ago, I stopped thinking of characters as something that I create and started thinking about them as people that I meet because that's kind of the way they present to me. And I get to know them in the same way that I would get to know anybody that I meet. Like they reveal themselves to me in layers, just like any relationship. But, you know, the truth of it is, is that, you know, that that's not true, that all characters are part of me in in some way. Like it's a, a it's an amalgamation of my my like the slivers of my psyche and my observations and people that I know and things that I've heard and, you know, research that I've done and all the stuff. So there's like, you know, every character is some, you know, like sort of mosaic of those things. So it's not that they come off the page to influence me. It's that they come from different elements within, within me and and manifest on the page. I think that's more the way it works than the other way around. I think it's probably safest that way. (laughs) I would say so. So, (laughs) Stephanie would like says, she says, Bailey was so intriguing to me. Did you know how he would progress in the story or was that a surprise? Did he end up where you thought he would? Ooh, good question. Yeah, he Bailey was a surprise um, to me. Like I, you know, when he he turned up, I really didn't know um, anything about him. The only thing I knew about Bailey when he turned up was that he really didn't like things that tried to stay lost. Mm. This was a thing that really bothered him, and that it had bothered him since he was a kid. Mm. Yeah, you know, there's a a, a section. Um, in, in the book about him where he says that, you know, everything has to, everything, everyone has to be somewhere. Mm. There's only a finite number of possibilities. And so he, and he's, you know, he's, um, he's one of the, he's one of like the stars at his detective agency. And when Ren is like sort of researching him, she's like looking through the, the website to try to figure out more about him. And, 
she's saying, you know, there's a, a, you know, an accolade saying that he has their highest success rate, that he's like their most effective investigator. And she was like, well, what does that mean? Like, so obviously the, like, what's the failure rate? Like failure is so much more interesting than success. Right. Like that's her thought about him. Like when did, when did he fail? Like, what does it mean? Like you didn't find someone or the bad guy got away. Like, so that's kind of what interested her. And so I was interested in that element of him too. Like, you know, who, what, I mean, and it's what really kind of drives me for all my characters is what make, what makes them who they are, you know, what, what formed them. So, yeah. And when he showed up, I really wasn't sure what, what role he was going to play. I definitely did not foresee his, um, how their relationship would progress. That was really a surprise. And um, yeah, there were lots of surprises along the way with Bailey. There were things I definitely did not expect. And I also didn't expect it. I don't know. I don't know why I didn't expect to invest in him as deep, as deeply as I, as I did. That is you know, so I, fascinating. Yeah. Cause I really, I, at first I was suspicious. I was like, this guy right. is here to like, spy on her. Ooh. He's here yeah. to, he's, He's got he's got a secret like, agenda. Like, he's not trustworthy. Yeah. Run, Ren, run! Like, don't trust this guy. But then I was like, oh my god, I love Bailey. Like, and so yeah, I think it was the point, like in, when she's in the when she's in the graveyard and she chases somebody into the woods, and then she's like just basically sitting on the ground, just exhausted and crying, and just like mm. you know, like. And he just kind of comes out of the you know he comes out of the woods and like he's been following her. And I think it was that moment when I was like, oh, okay, maybe he, maybe he is a good guy. So I w it was definitely a journey for me with him as well. He was like, yeah, you're, you know, kind of, you're kind of keeping me, uh, usually my job is pretty boring and not so <laughs> with you. And so um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I kind of like, that was the moment between them where the energy shifted and I was like, oh, okay. So maybe he's. Maybe he's okay after all. So that was good. <laughs> Melissa saying she has read all of your books. You are Thank one of you, Melissa. Favorite. That is so nice. Yay. That is Melissa, let us know if you have a favorite book in the comments, Melissa. What is your favorite Lisa Unger book? We would all be curious to know. Um, Lisa, one of the, oh, I'm, I, we have so many more questions. Um, Aaron is saying that uh, a Jones Cooper appearance that just makes me want Last Girl Ghosted even more. Yes. Following you on virtual book tour was so much fun. Lisa is a really fun guest, you guys. I have to, I have Thank to you. say. She's Thank you. George is saying, my wife got so frustrated with me today. She told me to stop acting like a flamingo. I had to put my foot down. <laughs> <laughs> We're all excited to meet James Cooper again. Uh, Melissa saying she laughed out loud when you referred to, to quote, just the I, husband. I know my poor husband. I mean, he's usually in the audience when I say he's just the husband. <laughs> um, don't worry, Stephanie. There's no spoilers. Oh, no, spoilers. no spoilers. No spoilers. No, no, no spoilers. We promise. We promise. Um, she said she was obsessed with the first and second person writing in this book of freaking sass. Yeah, let's talk about that, Lisa. Why did you make, from a craft perspective, why did you make those the choice to do it that way? I mean, I, again, and, and it always sounds weird to say, but it's true. It's really, especially when it comes to POV, like there's not a lot of choice. You know, um, I, um, you know, I hear things a certain way. Like I hear things in first person or I might hear things in third person omniscient. And like, it's so not a choice that if I, you know, at some point later in the book decided, oh, maybe I should try to write this in first person, or maybe I should try to do this in third person omniscient, like it would never work. Like I would never be able to make that change. Like it's just kind of part of how a story, you know, sort of, tells itself to me or how my subconscious tells my intellect a story that I put down on the page. So, um, but in this case, you know, and, and it was a little bit strange for me, you know, mm. she's very often in the book talking to Adam. She's uh -huh. talking to him, you know, because yes. she's, there you are, she says, there yeah. You. And they so she, she's talking to him and it, I, I, I felt that it reflected her deep attachment to an idea of him. 
right? Because he's not there. Mm. You really think about oh, okay. the relationship that she had with him. You know, she didn't know him that long. She feels like she did. It's not like they were married for years, you know, and she's so and she so intimately knew him that she was shocked by the fact that he ghosted her. But and yet she responds that way. You know, so she's young in that way and she's been lonely. And this is like the first time she's been able to connect in a real way since, you know, since college to anyone. And um, she, um, you know, she's got this deep attachment to him, but it can't really be to him. It has to be to her idea of him. Right. Because she doesn't even even the person that she thought she knew, you know, she says, I, you know, I've I've shared my I've shared my bed. I've shared my body with you. Yeah. Even the person that she thought she knew um, is not is not true. He's also a fiction. Yes. Yes. It, that was such a powerful moment and such a my heart winced because it's so true. She's she's feeling so like I've. I know this person and I have had these very you. intimate moments with this person. I've slept right. with this person and right. yet, and yet, and, and yet, and, and it was that yeah. the, the juxtaposition of these two thoughts and these two realizations, Lisa, right. that was so powerful. I loved that. Right. I mean, and she's not like, it's not that she's an unreliable narrator necessarily, no. like any more than any, but like we're all unreliable narrators, right? Of course. We're all terrible narrators of our own <laughs> life inside and out. Like what we tell ourselves and what we tell other people about what happened mm. to us and what we've done and how we feel. And it's always wrong. It's, a, it's, it's either a lie or it's a delusion or whatever. And so, you know, here she is like just kind of gutted by the fact that this guy left. I mean, and mainly it has to do with her shame, you know, that she told him this thing and he basically ran or that's how it seems. And, um, and yet, you know, she still feels like this connection to him or to the idea of him enough. So that she's talking to him throughout the book, which, you know, to be honest, I kind of felt like, you know, made her seem a little bit, a tiny bit unstable, you know, which, yeah, but, but, but which, yeah. Which she might be, cause it was like, you know, you didn't, you weren't that, you didn't, you know, you weren't together that long, but that's <laughs> how I heard, that's how I heard it. You know, that's how I heard her talking to him. And so I, uh, you know, I just honored that. Um, Lisa was like, I'm going to have to she, rain you in a little Ren. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to girl, rain. Come on, let's, let's talk. <laughs> She's like, put down that phone. Stop He's not the last Coca-Cola in the desert. <laughs> Oh my God. Stephanie is saying she felt the same as I did about Bailey. He was so suspicious, so yes. suspect, totally yeah. agree. She's saying she right. loved that scene too. Y'all, by the way, Stephanie is the awesome, uh, she's a bookstagrammer extraordinaire and she writes the best, the best book reviews. So she is fire pit and books on Instagram. I'm putting her link in the comments, follow her. Um, her pictures are also hot. See what I did there. Um, Aaron is saying it's hard to pick a favorite Lisa Unger book. If I have to, it's either all the Lydia books or in the blood. Okay, oh, Aaron. I love that. Thank you for that. Melissa saying she Thank doesn't you. have a husband, so she can say that it's just the husband. I should yeah. say it with an accent. It's just, <laughs> it's just the husband. It's not any Brit British. <laughs> it's oh my just God. the husband. <laughs> it's just the husband. Um, Melissa, oh, she, Melissa saying she um she mm. also loved in the blood. Mm. She loved it, and her 20-year-old daughter loved it too. Oh, that's so cool. You and your daughter read books together. I love that, Melissa. That's really, really cool. Yeah, that's um, a good one for like sort of a new adult reader in the blood, you know, because it has some really young characters in it. And um, yeah, that's nice to hear that. Thank you. Lisa, I want to talk about some of your, um, uh, oh, and Stephanie's letting us know that her review for Last Girl Ghosted, it will go up tonight. She already wrote it last night and it is so good. It would be awkward if it wasn't Stephanie because I just landed you know, it. I'd be like, no, okay. it better be good or I'm going to go back and let's do it. Um, Lisa, let's talk about some of your amazing reviews. So Publishers Weekly awarded your excellent book a starred review. Congratulations on, on, on earning that. Amazing. Um, and they said, and I quote, an enthralling psychological thriller, Unger is on a roll. 
So I loved that. But I also was wondering, as the recipient of that, do you feel the pressure like, oh, crap, I've got to keep the role going? Like, what will I do to top myself? Does the pressure feel crap? I, I actually think that would prevent me from writing because I'd be like, what if I stop rolling? Um, what is that, what is that I, you like know, luckily, the, luckily, this is this is the reason why I finished my, I try to finish my next book before the pre-publication reviews come out. I really do try. Does the pressure feel crushing or is it motivating or you don't care? I mean, I, no, no, I mean, it's neither, it's neither motivating nor, nor crushing to be, to be completely honest. Okay. I'm, you know, I've been writing a long time. I've been writing ever since I was a kid. Um, I've published 19, I've published 19 novels. Um, and, you know, I have come to learn over the years, over the many, yo, these many years that I literally control one thing. And that's what I do with the keyboard. That's it. You know, I, I literally can't, I can't control how people receive a book. I can't, I, I, mm -hmm. you know, I can't control whether they like it or they don't like it. I know in my heart that every book I have written is the absolute pinnacle of my ability at the time of its writing. And that every day when I sit down to write, I believe that I can be a better writer than I was yesterday. And I believe that with everything that I am, right? So hopefully everything I write is better than what came before it. Um, but I can only be the writer that I am. I can only do, I can only do my best at the keyboard. And I, I, I know for a fact that I do my best every day. I do my best with every book. I try to make it the best book it can be. Like I work really hard at that. It means something to me inside. I feel like it means something to my readers. And so that's the thing. And it's not really a pressure. It's just a, it's just a, it's a goal. It's like, it's an engine and it's a thrill. It's wonderful when people love the work and sometimes people don't love the work and that's okay. You know, they, you can't like, I mean, it's just like everybody else, like you go out on the street, like not everyone's going to like you, right? Like <laughs> some people are going to be like, oh, she's so great. And some people are going to be like, oh, I think she's mean or like whatever. Mm -hmm. For me, it's just a bigger, it's just a bigger scale, right? Like there's just more people that mm -hmm. are, you know, I love you. I hate you. Okay. I know. Like all that, but I have to, I have to go back. I have to go back to the keyboard every day and um, do my best work. Like that's what, that's oh. what I have to do. I can't, I can't do anything else. Oh, Lisa, I love that. It's such a beautiful attitude of service and work and humility. Yeah, service. Exactly. That's, that's what it, that's how it feels to me. Like I am in, I'm in service mm. to, the, to the writing and to my readers. And I, and I know for a fact that I do my best every single time I sit down to the keyboard and I hope it's enough. That's, that's it. That's all I can do. Wow. I love that. George chiming in to say what a great attitude to have. George, I totally agree. I mean, I just, the humility and your work ethic is so, is so impressive. And so, and I mean, just really lovely. Um, but Lisa, how do you stay on a roll for 19 novels? Because <laughs> If every time you are, as you said, in service and story, in service to your writer, to your readers, yeah. um, and doing the very best work that you are capable of in that moment, but then you're doing it again the next time. So that means you've, as the cool kids say, leveled up. Leveled and up. Yes. You've, you've <laughs> leveled my daughter up. Would say. You've leveled up. You've leveled up 19 <laughs> times, Lisa Unger. So how do you keep level, leveling up? Well, I mean, you're, you're always going to try to keep leveling up, right? Like in life. Like you're never just going to be like, yeah, today I'm just going to lie down on the couch and that's going to be the end of it, right? Like that's not a goal, is it? Like you're not, the goal is not to, um, it's not to do nothing, you know, it's not to be like, I'm done. I've done it right. Like that. I mean, I have arrived like, no, I am arriving. Right. I am, I am doing, you know, like, I don't ever want that to be, I don't ever want it to be like past tense. You know, oh. I don't, I don't want that. I mean, I don't think, um, I don't think that that's, I don't think that's a goal. 
right? I mean, yeah. is it? It's not. You just you're always gonna love. You're always gonna try to be a better person. And I like think about like you know, Sarah, your yo- yoga, right? Like I always come back to yoga as an example. Like yeah. you know, you're find you find comfort and discomfort. Like not things are not always easy, but you find a way to be at ease in the discomfort, right? Or like and and it's a practice, right? It's not a perfect it's a practice and every day that you bring yourself to the mat or you bring yourself to the keyboard and you do your best work that that is a success so i mean if if i am on a roll i i hope that it's just like the normal role of you know just trying to be better all the time as a person and as a writer lisa unger you melt my heart this is why i just in all of you as a yogi as a writer as a human being what an incredibly special soul george beach chiming in saying well then guess who is going to be buying all of your books (laughs) stephanie cooper saying me yay Um, thank you guys and i'm i'm gonna put the link in the comments right here again you can grab your signed copy for murder by the book you can support a woman-owned independent bookstore, one of the three oh, let's, dedicated let's, mystery bookstores in the country. Oh, yeah. I just want to say something about Murder by the Book. Yeah. I mean, what an amazing store. And McKenna, so I first started going to Murder by the Book when my parents lived in Houston. So I've been going to Murder by the Book, the physical place where you actually go, since my first book was published. And I love that store. It's a beautiful store. McKenna is an amazing, amazing person. And I um, hope that everybody here, um, you know, supports the store all the time. Yes, yes. And, you know, um, and I just want to say that tragically, since the pandemic descended 19 months ago, Mm. one independent bookstore a week has gone out of business, you guys. One independent bookstore a week has permanently shuttered its doors never to reopen again because times are tough on small businesses and especially bookstores, which have a very small profit margin. They are here for the love of books. They are here for the love of reading. They are in service to readers. They are in service to authors. They are in service to the craft of writing and the pleasure of reading. And we can vote with our dollars. Voting is not something that happens every four years or every two years. It is something every time you swipe your credit card, you are voting for the authors that you want to see published. Mm -hmm. You are voting for the stores that you want to see survive you are voting for the books you want to see on the shelf so shop wisely shop like it is a vote and vote for small businesses vote for women-owned businesses put your money where your mouth is and buy buy from an independent bookstore buy from a woman-owned bookstore um that's my that's my spiel thanks for coming to my ted talk back to lisa (laughs) tori eldridge saying at ease in the discomfort i am arriving never past tense oh tori i loved that too it was so powerful i mean it's like lisa was channeling from the divine as she was speaking yes bringing it in yeah (laughs) you were just exactly you were that conduit as you are for the conduit of your characters channeling across as well and that message of creativity george saying oh mckenna guess who will be by yes exactly (laughs) Thanks, George. By Stephanie saying, even as a bookstagrammer, she buys every book she reads, even when she gets the arc for free, just That's to support so nice. authors. What a beautiful thing! Thank you, That's Stephanie. Really good. Aaron you. saying, "Murder by the Book" is the best. I agree, yeah. y'all. Or right, we have three minutes left. Who has questions for Lisa Unger? I'm going to take your questions, get them going in the comments. Um, I'll give you a minute to to write them on up. We've got three minutes left, so I I bet I can do two or three more questions. Get them going in the comments. Let's. This is your chance to ask this incredible author anything you want. I'm going to share a few more reviews while you're thinking of your questions. Shari LaPena saying this book, Last Girl Ghosted, is, quote, chilling. You won't be able to stop turning the pages. I know I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Um, What an incredible review from your fellow amazing bestselling author there, Shari LaPena. She's amazing. Um, I absolutely loved that one. And there were, there is more, um, where that came from. Ooh, Stephanie's got a question. What is the title of your next book? Lisa Uh Unger. No way. (laughs) Do you, has it, have you channeled it yet? Or, I have the title, come? but the chance that we, we could talk about titles for a minute. The chances are that the title will not, the title that I have for it right now will not be the title that it winds up with. So the, here's the, here's the rule. If I absolutely love the title, my editor will hate it. Oh, if are we going I, back to the night of the, the night jar? Yes. Right. And there's been so many books, like that, so many things like that. Like not, you know, like also, like beautiful lies like that is a book that i that title i absolutely hated i thought it was a completely stupid title they loved it 
<laughs> it was a working title and they loved it. And so there been, there've been other, so if there, there've been so many like title, like dramas or whatever, but yeah, that's generally the rule. Like if I love a title and think that this is it, this is the only title this book can have. Usually it winds up getting, usually it winds up getting changed. Like even confessions on 745, which I will say is probably the best title. The best. One of the best titles ever. The best. Right. Like I will say that that was not, that was not my title. That was my editor. <laughs> that was my, what was your title? title? My title for that book was black butterfly. Oh my God. Okay. So can we assume since, since, since that, that this next title is going to go over the way of the dodo bird or the way yeah. of the night jar or the way of the black butterfly? <laughs> yeah, it, it might, it might, we'll see. It remain. it remains to be seen. Oh my God. So I will let you guys know when we come back and talk about it next year, I'll let you know if the title that I have in my head right now is the same title. And then I will tell you then what this title, what the title is. Okay. Don't forget. Okay. I won't. I okay. Won't. Okay. Oh. So we, have you ever gotten your way, Lisa? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have under my skin was okay. my title. Um, the stranger inside was not my title. That was the, the night jar. <laughs> the, the, the red hunter was my title. Okay. Okay. So, so fragile. What your batting averages. Fragile was my, I would say fifty percent probably. Oh my god. Okay. Melissa saying thank you, Sarah, and so exciting to see Lisa, her favorite author again. Stephanie thank Cooper you, saying Melissa. thank you for writing such a great book. Definitely one of the best books of the year. Thank, thank you, you for that. That's super. Thank a lot. Thank you. Fire pit and books, Aaron. Alford saying the night jar needs to at least be a short story if it can't be a novel. Yeah. I, well, I, it is a novel. It's just, I, yeah, I mean, maybe I should write a short story called the night jar. I, I, Aaron, I if I write it, I will, title. I will, I will, I uh, will, I'll dedicate it to you, Aaron, if I write it. Or tell, you know, tell your publisher that, that your fans demand it, Lisa. They demand it. They demand, they demand a novel called the night jar. <laughs> Yeah, we demand it. We won't be satisfied with anything less. Um, <laughs> guys, I just want to share really quickly these super great reviews. I'm, oh my gosh, that's too big. Um, from the incredible JC Ellison, who was on the show a few months ago, and also Luann Rice, who was on the show a couple months ago. These rave reviews, I'm putting them in so you can check them out, as well as Hannah Mary McKinnon, who was all, who's been on the show twice. All of our all of our friends and favorite authors are raving, raving, raving about this book. So check it out. Grab it, bookless raving, an immersive tale of passion and vengeance with a startling ending. I think that might be my favorite review. Passion yeah. and vengeance. Erin <laughs> saying she demands it. We demand it. Okay, who's got their who's got their um their pickets and ready to go with their or whatever exactly. those signs are called? Um, all right, y'all, we are over our time. I'm putting the link in the comments one more time. So grab your copy, shop. Uh, support an independent bookstore, support a woman-owned bookstore. And don't forget to join my free and open to all Facebook group, Mystery and Thriller Mavens, to continue the conversation. And you know what? I'm going to buy, a I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to buy a copy of Lisa's book and I'm going to give it away. So hop on yeah. over there and enter my giveaway to, uh, to, to win your copy of Lisa's book from Murder by the Bookstore. Bam. Awesome. Lisa Unger, parting thoughts that something I, you wish I'd ask anything you want to sign off with? No, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here. It's always a joy to talk to you and to talk to readers. And, you know, like a lot of times you spend a lot of the year, you know, alone in your head, alone with your characters. And, you know, we're all, most writers are introverts. So that's not yes. like, that's not the end of the world, but um, it's always wonderful to connect with booksellers with wonderful, um, authors and bookstagrammers like you and just my like amazing readers like it's just like it's really super exciting to be able to talk about the book finally after being alone with it for so long yay well i'm thrilled to have our fellow author tori eldridge on with us tonight yeah um, hi tori uh, with our our, uh, our bookstagram friends, Stephanie and others. Great to have you here. George saying, what do we want? Night jar. When do we want it? Soon. George, you're <laughs> a man after my own heart. All right. Well, on that, on that peppy note, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you, Facebook, for getting your act together and getting yeah. back online. Thank goodness. Um, Y'all, the book is Last Girl Go G Last Girl Ghost. And the author is Lisa Unger. The bookstore is Murder by the Book. And... <laughs> 
I have been, it has been my honor to be your host and I will see you next Monday for hashtag mystery Monday. Cause you know, Mondays can be murder. Lisa Unger, I will see you next year when the unrevealed title that <laughs> may or may not go the way of the night jar, the black butterfly and the dodo bird <laughs> may or may not be, and may or may not be that title or the others. Have a great night y'all. Thank you. Awesome. For Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for everything you do. Oh, it's my pleasure. And,